the banshee is a harbinger, fancy word, but she's the one who warns certain Irish families of death, of a coming death in the family. And Irish people, they weren't afraid of the banshee. Most people heard the banshee rather than saw the banshee. But I've heard people, I've recorded people who actually saw the banshee. Most heard, few saw. I've recorded a people, a few people who did actually see her. And the description they gave me of her was tall, thin woman with long grey hair. Now, I... I've, I've recorded a couple of long stories about her, too long to go into here, but one of them, frightening story, it was on the way home from the fair of Gott, a young man uh, at the time, here they were now after a miserable day at the fair, <laughs> and they were coming back nearly dawn, the sun he saw the light in the window, the mother obviously making the breakfast. And just as I was coming in the boreen, there, sitting above on the wall on the left-hand side, he told me, was this woman combing her hair, long grey hair. <coughs> and then, no, she was. She wasn't anybody local. So anyway, the father and the son, they were together. And as the pastor, the father saluted her, no reply, she just kept combing and combing. And they passed on. Now, the gate, the gate, was just ahead of him. And the uncle was a couple of steps behind, and he saluted, no reply. But the boy told me, the old man, as he was then, he said the uncle was a different kind of a fellow entirely when he got no reply. He crept over and he snapped the comb out of her hand, not meaning no harm, but just to see what he gets a response. And immediately there was this wail. He said, <laughs> well, he said, it froze their blood. Or mine anyway, he says. Well, they made for the gate and made, burst in the gate and made for the door. We burst in the door and he said, what I noticed was my mother there at the fire, open fireplace at the time, and she's stirring a pot of whatever she was making for the breakfast, probably porridge or something. And she looked at us and she saw the comb, obviously, in my uncle's hand. And she said, close the door, close the door. And my father around, slammed out the door and this crying surrounded the house. And my mother said, what the, what the Christ did you do? And when she saw the call, of course, she said, oh, Lord Christ, she said, what, what, what are you after doing? And my uncle said, oh, all right, she says, I, I'll give it back. And my mother said, no, 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 she said. And she made for the fire where the tongues was. And she said, give me that. And she took the comb in the tongs, no big old-fashioned tongs, you know, like the, the ones a blacksmith would make, and took the comb in the tongs, and she said, open it, a small bit. And my father opened the door a couple of inches, and she poked out the tongs and the comb on it, and immediately it was snapped out of her hand, and she slammed out the door. And the thing stopped, the crying stopped. Now... The one thing he remembered, he said, was the silence. And the four of them there in the kitchen, and the silence, he said, it, it seemed like ten minutes, which he said was probably only ten seconds. But that silence. And then he said, my mother, luckily somebody kept their sense. My mother went over to the window, and of course, you know, in a cottage, small windows, and the shutters, you know, timber shutters, that didn't be open. And it was dawn by now, and she looked out. And there, down on the footpath, before the, under the window, was the tongues, the heavy tongues now, and it twisted into an S hook. And she said to my uncle, Come here, she said, Look at this. Look out there. And he did. And she says, If you had put out your hand with that comb, that'd be your hand now, that'd be your arm now. A dirty looking idiot, she says. That for the banshee. She says, Why didn't you leave him alone? Or le leave her alone about her business and go about your business? And he said, That happened. That happened, he said. That man is still alive.
Hey guys, Bill here. You know, when it comes to monsters, I don't think there's a single country in the world that doesn't have at least one monster that everybody knows about. But when it comes to the country with the most monsters, I think Ireland has to be right up there at the top because they got a whole bunch of them. So I thought what we would do today is just take a look at the top five monsters of Ireland. And to help us out is junior reporter Olivia B. Thanks, Bill, and hello from Ireland. While it's true that every country has its own monsters to deal with, Ireland has more monster legends than any place I know. Picking just a few was not easy, but here what experts agree are the top five monsters in Ireland. Number five, the Dullahan. The Dullahan is said to be one of the most terrifying creatures in the spirit world. According to legend, Dullahan is headless and rides a black stallion across the countryside. He carries his own severed head in his hands. Some say that his head can see in even the darkest of nights. The Dullahan uses the spine of a human corpse for a whip. And trust me, you never want to be anywhere near where he stops. Because when he does that, someone always dies. Number 4. The Kalish The Kalish is a winter goddess and is often portrayed as an old woman or a hag. As the legend goes, Kalish comes out of her cave on February 1st each year to collect more wood for her fire. In good weather, she's able to gather more wood, meaning that winter will last another six weeks. However, if the weather is bad and she can't gather wood, winter is proclaimed as over. She may not be the scariest monster in the books, but she still wields a lot of influence. <laughs> Number three, Far Darig. Far Darig is a mischievous fairy who rides on a black horse and busies himself with playing gruesome practical jokes. Also known as Rat Boy, he's fat, has hairy skin, a long snout, and skinny tail. He never speaks, but somehow mortals understand his commands and have to obey. Not only will he snatch babies from their cribs and replace them with sickly fairy changelings, but he also likes to use his special power to make people have terrible nightmares. Number two, the puka. Puka is the Irish word for goblin, one of Ireland's most feared spirits. According to legend, a puka can take on a variety of shapes and sizes in order to wreak havoc. It's said that the puka often changes into a horse or a calf, rushes between a victim's legs, and then hoists them away for a terrifying ride across the countryside. <laughs> Besides horses and cows, the puka can also take on the shape of a bird or a bat to scratch at the face of its victim. This spirit typically lies in wait for its victims at eerie places, such as crossroads, fences, or bridges. Number one, the banshee. The banshee is the most feared monster in Ireland because she is a forebearer of death, only appearing in the household when someone is about to die. She can show up in a variety of forms, but all with disheveled hair. If she chooses, she can appear as a frightful hag or a beautiful maiden. Usually, she arrives with a blood-curdling shriek. And if more than one banshee shows up, it means that someone of great importance is about to die. Lenahan, L-E-N-I-H-A-N, and Eddie. Um, what I have been interested in for quite a number of years is uh, the fairies. So a, 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 an old man said to me once, and he was a reliable old man, a man who wasn't given all of the nonsense. I think I have 150 hours of him on tape. He was an encyclopedia of knowledge about local history and about this kind of thing. And, and he said to me once, he said, look, the fairies are like us. He said, the person sitting next to you could be one of them and you wouldn't know it. And that's a frightening thought. They can take any shape they like. And one of their favorite shapes, according to Irish tradition, is the black dog. He said, that's where, on that road bridge, the black dog used to be seen. He was a monster. He was as big as a horse. And he'd plonk himself there on his backside, on the bridge, and his backside out for the wall on either side. And fellas coming back at night from the pub or 
from card playing or from visiting their neighbours. Christ, as soon as they come to this monster, <laughs> what were you going to do? Ask him, hello, hello little doggy, can I pass you by? He said, they, they, they were frightened out of their wits of him. And so they were having to go two or three miles out of their way by other roads, or, or more dangerously still, uh, cross the river upstream or downstream, which was okay in the summertime when the river was low, but in the winter time when the river was flooded, you could be drowned. No, there was a plank there, uh, across, but I mean, crossing by a plank on a flooded night, dangerous, dangerous. So eventually they said, look, what do we do about this? Who could help us? And they decided that the obvious man was the priest, the parish priest. So they went to him. <laughs> and you know the reception they got? A lecture. Why, in the name of God Almighty, don't you stay out of the pubs and you wouldn't be seeing black dog nonsense. Christ, he said, will you go home and have a small bit of sense? And... You know, they still, they still had to travel the road at night. So they were still having to go around. And eventually they sent their wives to the priest. Now, now, that was different. Because in those days you might laugh at a man. But women weren't going to the pubs uh, in Ireland. They might be having their little drop at home. But they weren't going to the pubs. And when the women, the wives, started coming to the presbytery, to the priest's house, he began to take notice. And he began to think, maybe there is something in this. So they got He said, look, it would do no harm to check it out. So that very night, when the women were gone about their business, he went armed with holy water and his book, prayer book, I presume, came to the bridge, met nothing. But he was a careful kind of a man, and he came the second night, nothing. Third night, nothing. But the fourth day was a Sunday. So he said he'd put an end to this once and for all. So... God Almighty, at Mass that Sunday, he preached them a sermon off of the altar, calling them all kinds of superstitious peasants and blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Of course, they went out of there feeling like that height. But yet, eh, the dog was still there, and the women were still coming to the priest, night after night after night. And he went back, he went back the fourth night, no, the fifth night, just to keep the women quiet at this stage. Sixth night, nothing. On the seventh night... Didn't he meet the dog? Now, lucky for himself, he had his holy water and, and, and his book. And the man that was telling me the story said that the, the neighbours all around, they had the yelping. They had the screeching, screeching, ten times as loud as any ordinary dog. And, of course, nobody went out to investigate. They figured out it must be the priest had met the animal. And it was only the following morning, a man going out to collect his cows to bring them in to milk them. Down near where the stream went into the sea, I won't even call it an estuary because the stream's only about four miles long, small, there he found the dog, inside in the water, dead, with its legs up in the air. And, of course, the, do the news spread. People came from ten miles around to see this creature. What in God's name was it? Oh, yeah, a dog. They knew what it was, of course. They knew that this was no ordinary dog. And as the man said, look, he said, my father was there that morning. He saw it with his own two eyes. He told me the story. And after a few more days, a high tide came in and washed the dog, or whatever it was, out and to see no more. But he says, anybody who will tell you that these things don't exist doesn't know what he's talking about. All that it means is he's never met them. But anybody who has... I tell you, they have a different idea of the fairies than this little... Can I say hello to the folks at home? Hello, everybody. And I hope you're all going to enjoy whatever we get up to, because we're going to try a few things. Yeah. So, uh, the folks, Raven, if you don't remember, tell me about Raven. Raven. For the people at home, can you tell them, Ravenstillwood, can you explain to us what's happening here, Raven? What happened over here in the last couple of years, Ravenstillwood? couple of years, well... Maybe a bit more than that. Yeah. Some very nasty uh, events took place over there by the bridge. Yeah. Over the river. Yeah. There was uh, a British soldier who was literally battered to a pulp and then shot. His bones or his body has never been found. And his name is Isaac. He was Captain Nyrak of the British Army. Mm -hmm who was working undercover in South Armagh and he was responsible, he was at the scene of the massacre of the Miami show band. Yes, actually when Joe was watching this at the moment, to Joe, it would be Kevin's father and he explained some of the history of the, the Miami show band and what he told me was is that they were coming home on a minibus and they were all... That's right. I actually 
actually watched the documentary Just Stay. Yes, it's on uh, YouTube. Yes, of uh, one of the survivors, one of the two survivors. Yes. Yeah. He explained everything that happened that night and how he got blown over yeah. the hedge in the ditch and down into the field. And his his story is true. That's this uh, Captain Nizarak, is it? Nairak. Nairak. Did he have something to do with the killing of the Miami show that? He was present that night, yes. yes. That night. Because they heard the clear, um, high, posh English accent. And he, smallish man. man. Uh, come here. Uh, we're going to move away from that now, right? So you roughly have a rough idea. We so, see, we have so much to cover here tonight. That's only one. Mm. We, we have about five or six different stories to tell. This man here called Maker Med. He said you're one hundred percent right, and this man knows he knows the history of the uh, Miami show band, and he says that this man I keep forgetting Captain Nairac Nairac was an evil man, very 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 evil man, and he uh, crossed the border and he shot people in their houses in the south. In other words, he was a bit like out of the He problem. was a, a bit of a, a a loner. He just did his own thing, mm-hmm. yeah. and I know by watching, yeah, but I, I know by watching some of the research on YouTube. That the people that did kill uh, Nizarak, the soldier, said that he was a very proud man, and he, he and he, he took it well. I don't know. Did you see that on the? Well, news? he was awarded a posthumous military cross yes. because of his his bravery. His, his, his bravery and not giving anything away to yeah. his torture. Yes. So, come here, John, uh, for the people at home. That uh, he he was SAS, whatever that means. Uh, he was trained by the SAS to yeah. come and work in South Armagh. Right. Pretending to be a, a, a labourer from Belfast. Sorry. So, it's believed the story, Sean, that uh, he was captured in Johnstown, um, Georgeboro. A place called Drummond T, the Three Steps Pub. Yes. And he was taken to this bridge over here. To yes. Have... And literally beaten to a pulp. Right. And then shot. Right. So, this Captain Nizarak. He was brought over to this bridge where we're, where we're going to start our investigation tonight. Yeah. And he's supposed to be shot and killed at this location. Yes. And there's two stories going. There's one story going saying that he was put to a meter grinder. No, no. no. And there's another story saying that he was shot here and dragged and buried somewhere in this location. Yes. Now, I knew a man who's dead now. He, he, he worked. He was in the IRA in the 50s. Yes. And he said that Nairak's body was built into a bridge. Built into the bridge. And we've we've only actually two bridges here. We have this one here and we have the one on the way up to Well the, it wouldn't be that one because that's where he was actually killed. Yeah. So there's only one bridge and that's the one, the big one on the one. Could be. Could be. Right. So that is your Roofing father the story. God rest his soul and your mother. Uh, your father was given a job back here. He was a forestry uh, um ganger. What uh, year was that roughly? Oh wow well, wow well, well. Uh, early 50s. So, 1850, 1950. 19. So, 1950, your father was offered a job here in Ravenshill Wood. Yeah, oh, he'd been working for some time. Yeah. But then he was promoted to the ganger. Yeah. And he was given the use of the house up here. Right. And we all lived there for 10 years. So, what we're trying to tell the people is this, um, this man here, <laughs> Mr. Walters. Walters, Walters. Walters. His father was actually given a beautiful job here, okay? Mm. And um, he, he thought was getting, these trees. planting all these trees in this wood. In, in hand, working in here, his father was given, and his wife, uh, to bring up his family in the gamekeeper's cottage mm. that's located on top of the hill of this mountain. That's right. And shown us so many stories. We're, we're going to get to that in a few minutes, okay? But the story goes, we're, we're going to run through as quick as we can, that the, the gamekeeper himself, now, if I'm wrong, Sean, you can tell me here as well. So, the gamekeeper himself was out doing his work one night, and there was a, he was supposed to be shot a young boy by for poaching. Is this yeah. correct? Yeah. So the gamekeeper shot a young boy in his teenage years. And he the, was a widow's son. He was a widow's son. And the story goes, with Sean says, that the, the gamekeeper that lived in the gamekeeper's cottage before Sean's father and mother took it over. Long before. Long before Sean's mother and father took the gamekeeper's cottage over, the gamekeeper hung himself in the living room right. over for shooting the young boy. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, roughly. Because the widow put a curse on the man. Yes. For shooting her only son. son. Yeah. Now, I'll tell you a little story. One night I came up here on my own. Yes. Uh, to the old house. And yes. I had a wee dog with me. Yes. And some treats for him in my bag. Yes. I went into that 
main room where they hook on the yes. ceiling, yeah. lit the fire as usual, yeah. and the little dog would not enter, not, would, no. no matter how no. much I tried to persuade him, he would not. Yeah. So, these are some of the stories, but some of the stories that Mr. Waters has to tell me here is unbelievable. But what one has really, really got my attention, you have, you have there's, there's one that's got really, because is this, actually, I'm going to come back to that one in a minute, but I'm going to come back to the one where your mother was in the room with your father, and you were in the in the small box room. You're all going to see it, hopefully, tonight. And uh, your mother heard the scraping on the floor. That's you, right, a big claw. See claws coming from upstairs. I'm just coming ahead on, the, the, on the bare wooden floor. On the floor. She was throwing shoes at the damn thing. Yeah. So, can you tell the people, I explain to the people, I always do a little ad before I go somewhere. Hmm. And I explain about the black dog with the red eyes at Raven's Day Wood. That's the one so, I saw. So the people at home, listen to what um, Mr. Walters is going to say now, right? I want you to listen to this story. This man was brought up in this wood from what age, roughly? From about 4 to 14. 10 years. So 10 years he spent here as a young lad, living here in Raven's Day Wood. Yeah. So anybody knows the history about this, this, this place would be Mr. Walters. <laughs> so um, explain to the folk, look at the camera, explain what, your, what you experienced, your experience of this black creature. Well... I was coming up from the road over there, where I did some shopping that yes. was left. Yes. Uh, two bags and had a torch. I was happily whistling along, and uh, I had a wee dog with me. Yes. And suddenly, this rush between me and the stream beside yes. the stream yes. beside me. Yes. Suddenly, in the light of the torch, this massive black hound with Blazing red eyes appeared yes. and disappeared in in, in in a split second. Yeah, and I came over all the hot from head to toe. Yes, and I began to scream because I was uncontrollably shocked. And come here, and that happened just a couple of hundred yards away from from this bridge where we started tonight's show. Yeah, up here to the left side, up to there. And and so um, so when you what do we say when you can you picture what age roughly were you then? You turned about seven or eight. Yeah. So your mother's